couple of weeks ago, I did a podcast episode with my friend Paul Sagala from ExxonMobil, and we covered diesel engine oils. Now, one of the things that came up in that episode was the effect of lubricants on fuel efficiency. And we talked about a couple of different things. So HTHS viscosity, bulk viscosity, as well as the use of synthetics in both engine and driveline fluids and their effect on fuel efficiency of large diesel trucks. Now, this is an extremely important issue for fleets because often fuel can make up sometimes, you know, 30% of the total budget. And with fuel prices increasing, anything that we can do at the margins to improve fuel economy is going to have a massive effect on the bottom line. Now, one of the things that came up in that episode is that typically by using, you know, a combination of synthetics and maybe lower viscosity oils, we can get let's say one and a half percent kind of fuel efficiency gains out of uh, a switch in lubricants. Now, what was really interesting about that episode was the comment section. And in particular, there was one comment from an Amsoil either reseller or distributor, which talked about the small effect on fuel economy. Like why is it only one and a half percent? And they pointed to a case study, which has actually been run by Amsoil some number of years ago, where they saw 8.2% fuel economy improvements by switching from a Shell Rotella T15W40 to an Amsoil Synthetic, I think, Series 3000 5W30. Now, 8.2% typically kind of sets off some alarm bells. Anything kind of above 2, 2.5% is something that I tend to be quite skeptical of. And there's good reason for it. Let me explain why. To explain this, we have to go back to first principles and explain where does the fuel exactly go? So fuel is obviously converted in an engine into effectively three different forms. We get waste heat, which is generated. We also get exhaust gases. And then there's an element of what we might term useful work or simply work. So that work is used to overcome friction. It's used to overcome, let's say, the brakes. It's used to overcome rolling resistance, air drag, all sorts of things like that. So what are the what are the percentages? Now, interestingly enough, internal combustion engines are not particularly efficient. And there are a number of studies which have tried to quantify where all of this energy goes. And if fuel is making up 100%, what com kind of components do we have in here? Now, each of these studies kind of breaks them out into different groups. So for example, you can see that the first study looks at the waste heat, which has to go to the cooler, right? And the first study actually breaks those out by how much heat goes into the air cooler versus the jacket water versus the oil cooler and actually splits those out. The others don't deal with that. Same with exhaust. Now you might ask, why do we have relatively large differences in each of these four studies? Like how difficult is it to really measure the energy output from an internal combustion engine? That's a good question. Um, basically the differences come down to what kind of like cycle are we running? Um, you know, some of these are run in diesel engines, some are in petrol engines, that changes the efficiency. Some engines are more efficient than others. In some cases, you're testing in an old versus a new engine. In some cases, it's different driving cycles as well. So in some cases, they're taking into account, you know, braking as well as air drag as well as acceleration, and some are just done at a constant speed. But broadly speaking, all three buckets are pretty close to each other. And so I can think, you know, once you get consensus across four different studies, you can say that the numbers seem to stack up. What's really interesting about this is how much of this energy truly goes into what we might term friction. And what all, well, at least three of the four studies say is that engine friction is about 5 to 8% of fuel consumption. So you can already see where the alarm bells go off. When someone says that they are saving 8.2% on fuel economy, but friction itself can only be between five and 8% of fuel consumption, how can we square that circle? That doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. And this is where we get into the idea that the AMSOIL study and the studies that, for example, Mobile has done and Shell has done similar studies in the past, where they're not comparing apples to apples. This is more like comparing apples to steak. If you work with lubricants as part of your job, you know how essential they are to reliability. And that's why I've tried to make training as accessible as possible. So if you go to lubrication.expert, I've made all certification training. So MLA1, MLA2, MLT1, VIM and VPR available for $100 US a month. Now there will be MLA3 and CLS that are coming soon as well as MLT2. I'm working on all of those. And again, they'll all be included in the same subscription bundle. So lubrication.expert, check it out. Now let's look at it from the mobile perspective to begin with. What we generally understand, right, is that uh, a lot of the engine friction losses are the result of viscous drag inside the lubricant. 
And when we move from a 1540 to something like a 1030, so we're lowering the bulk viscosity of the lubricant, we can generally say that the fuel economy improvement is somewhere between one to one and a half percent. When we move from a 10W30 to another 10W30 with a low HTHS, so this is the difference between a CK4 and an FA4 engine oil, we expect to gain anywhere between half a percent and another percent. And this is why seeing numbers that are in the low single digits when we're changing between engine oils is usually a sign that it is a credible number in terms of fuel economy savings. And like I said, right, in the first instance, it's the bulk viscosity. In the second, it's the HTHS. And both of those are simulating different parts of the engine. So in the bulk viscosity, we're talking about the viscous drag of moving the oil around the engine. Right? That is part of what's contributing to energy loss. And in the second component, which is HTHS, we're talking about that viscous drag that's specifically in high temperature, high shear applications, like you would see in cams and gears. Right? So both of those are kind of independent components and we lose energy in both instances. And this is why we're seeing this trend towards lower viscosity lubricants and increasingly now low HTHS viscosity lubricants. But this is not the only way that we can lose energy in the system. So going back to our table where we say, where does that 100% of fuel consumption go? What happens if we are simply reducing the amount of fuel burnt, right? Now that means that less fuel is getting converted into energy and therefore less fuel is con being converted into work, exhaust gases and exhaust heat. How exactly does that happen? Well, very simply put, it's generally done through the buildup of deposits. Deposits in the engine are also detrimental to fuel consumption. Now, most people think of these as being deposits on the fuel injectors. So if you're affecting the spray pattern, you may be getting a bit more fuel dilution in the crankcase, but also you're affecting the combustion efficiency and you have more fuel that is simply not converted into heat and useful work. Now, now, the lubricant has very little effect on the actual fuel injectors themselves. And if you want to clean up injectors, then... Number one, the best way to do it is to use a high quality, reasonably high detergent fuel in the first place so you don't get fuel injector fouling. But once it does happen, using something like a fuel system conditioner or a fuel system cleaner is going to have a high amount of detergency that can then f clean those spray nozzles and then get an efficient spray. So how do lubricant deposits affect our overall efficiency? Well, think of it this way. The piston rings are acting as a gasket against the cylinder wall. And actually the gasket is a combination of both the piston rings as well as the lubricant film. Now, one of the big trends over the last few years has been a move to low tension piston rings. The problem with low tension piston rings is that they are more susceptible to deposits. So if we get deposits on the backside of the piston ring and we don't allow them to open up as much, we then um, reduce the efficiency of that seal. And eventually what we're going to get is a situation where we get blow by of combustion gases. Now that's going to affect our compression efficiency on the upward stroke, but it also means that there is a certain amount of combustion energy, which is not going to go into actually moving the piston itself. And in so doing, we are reducing the overall efficiency. So how does this relate to the difference between Mobile's fuel economy comparison and the Amps Oil fuel economy comparison? Basically, what Mobile was doing was that they were running on new engines on a test track where they looked at the difference between a mineral oil with a mineral drivetrain and a, and a synthetic oil and a synthetic drivetrain. New engines drove them around the track, look at the difference in fuel economy. Now, in contrast, the Amsoil test was done on an older engine that had been running a Shell Rotella T, I think, mineral synthetic oil for a 15W40, as well as Quaker State uh, SAE90 in the transmission and a Citgo uh, 85W140 in the drive axles. Now, I believe all of those products were actually minerals. Now, the big difference here is if you're using in an old engine, which has built up a whole bunch of deposits, by using a you know, synthetic oil with a high degree of detergency and maybe a high degree of solvency, by removing a whole bunch of these deposits and, for example, affecting a better seal of the piston ring on the liner, then we can improve the amount of energy that is converted into useful work. And that's why you can see a much bigger gain. We often see this when converting from old engines to new engines when you upgrade the oil. What you get is massive fuel economy improvements and most of that is not necessarily down to moving from a mineral to a synthetic and the you know, various frictional uh, advantages that you get from that. A lot of the changes are actually from simply cleaning up the engine. Now, I should say that there is always a risk of doing this. I have seen in plenty of cases where we 
upgrade to a high detergent synthetic oil. And what it actually does is it exposes a whole bunch of leaks in the system. And what I find, uh, what I find in fleets then is that the synthetic oil tends to cop a lot of the blame when in fact all the deposits that have built up in the system and are helping to paper over the cracks is actually deposits that have been formed from a, a, a lower grade sort of mineral oil. Just to boil it down, I think that both the mobile comparison as well as the amp soil comparison both have merit. However, we are comparing apples and oranges when we are talking about these fuel economy advantages. Remember, fuel economy can come from a few different sources. One is frictional gains and the other is cleanliness gains.